SpaceX Starship launches again. Webb finds methane in the atmosphere of an exoplanet and reveals a star-forming region near the center of the Milky Way. The overwhelming logistics of dealing with an asteroid threat. All this and more in this week's Space Bites. Well, it happened again. SpaceX tried to launch the Starship and Super Heavy Stack from Boca Chica, Texas on Saturday. And I was like in bed asleep and then I woke up like five minutes before the launch and I like grabbed my phone and like watched the whole launch on my phone and it was perfect timing. <laughs> Shows you sort of how connected I am to the space industry. Anyway, so here's what happened. Now, the last time we saw the launch was back in April, and with that one, there were a few problems. One, when Starship launched, it caused this fire tornado that tore up the launch platform, scattered chunks of concrete into the vicinity, and then after it launched, it sort of broke in half the, and exploded. So this time they fixed those problems. First, they completely upgraded the launch platform. They built a proper flame diverter with a water deluge system that's designed to handle the thrust from these 33 Raptor engines. They also developed a new system for separating the super heavy booster from Starship. It's called a hot staging. And so with the previous iteration, the plan was the rocket would take off and then it would disconnect and then the booster would fly back home and land and Starship would keep going. But it was tricky to get Starship away from the super heavy booster. So this time around, the plan was that Starship would fire its engines while it was still connected to super heavy and that would push it away from the top of the booster and then that would give them adequate space to complete their various maneuvers. So these were the new things that SpaceX was attempting to test. And so on Saturday morning, we saw the rocket take off and it was amazing. Uh, you know, we saw that same giant exhaust plume as the rocket took off and right away, just as it was clearing the launch tower, you could see that all of the engines were lit. Last time, not all of them were lit and, and more went out as the rocket took off. This time they were all working fine. It continued to rise and it reached the region of maximum dynamic pressure and still everything was holding great. And then they had to do this hot staging event. And I, this was the part that I thought was going to go a little weird, uh, but it worked great. The Starship took off from the super heavy booster and then the super heavy booster did a kickback and you could see that, you know, it had turned off most of its engines because it didn't want to keep firing them. And then it was attempting to relight them and it didn't look like they were relighting properly. And then within a few seconds later, Super Heavy exploded. So that ends that test. We didn't get a chance to see Super Heavy land softly in the ocean. Starship kept going. And again, you could see the engines on Starship. Everyone was working perfectly. And at about the eight minute mark, they lost signal with Starship. And what appears to have happened is that the spacecraft veered off course a bit, and then they caused the automatic termination system to go off and it exploded Starship. And so it wasn't able to make the ballistic trajectory for it to try and do a soft landing. But you know, I would classify this as a success. Yes, Super Heavy was destroyed, but I mean like, that's what happens with almost all other rocket first stage boosters is that they are destroyed. Uh, think about what happened with the space launch system. It was crashed into the ocean. And then with Starship, it would have been great to see it complete its ballistic trajectory and touch down safely. Something went wrong and I'm, I'm sure we're gonna find out in due time. But, but just like overall, I thought it was an exciting step. It felt just a lot cleaner. Everything was working a lot better. You know, clearly they had made tons and tons of tiny improvements that all came together. So there are still many more Starships and Super Heavies lined up ready for testing. And because this didn't cause the same amount of damage to the launch facility, my guess is they're gonna get approval from the FAA to do another launch relatively soon. Now, I know you enjoyed when I did a breakdown with Marcus House and Scott Manley, and so I'm planning to get the band back together again. Uh, Marcus and Scott have both agreed, and in a couple of days, we're gonna sit down and just really talk about what happened with the launch and really what the future holds now now with this test out of the way. Webb finds methane on an exoplanet.
James Webb has been doing its two main jobs, right? The one job is to peer into the early universe, look back to a time when the universe was just a few hundred million years old, see those first galaxies coming together. But the other main job is to analyze the atmospheres of exoplanets. And we've talked many times about all of the planets that have observed so far, all of the gases and vapors that have been found in the atmospheres of these planets. You know, it's found water vapor, it's found carbon dioxide, carbon monoxide, sulfur dioxide, and a bunch of other stuff. Well, now astronomers announced that they have detected the presence of methane. And methane is a really exciting chemical to find. There is trace amounts of methane in the atmosphere of Earth, and it is produced by living creatures, by bacteria that produces this as an output, methanogens. And so it's thought that if we can find methane, in other worlds that could be an indicator for life, a biosignature. But like, don't get too excited because you can get methane without biological activity. There is methane in the, all of the giant planets in the solar system. Think about Titan, right? Like it rains methane in Titan. There's lakes of methane. It was probably not produced by life on Titan. And this planet is called WASP-80b. And it's classified as a warm Jupiter. So it's not one of these hot Jupiters that's really close to the star and is thousands of degrees. It is merely 500 degrees Celsius, which is still incredibly hot, much hotter than the surface of Jupiter. But it's just a demonstration that, you know, can Webb see methane? Yes, it can. And so maybe when the right oh, I don't know, Trappist planet is observed, and they're able to detect the presence of methane, and the temperature regime is right, maybe that's an indicator that there could be life there. Webb looks into the heart of the Milky Way. A few weeks ago, we talked about some work done by Webb to look into the heart of the Milky Way. And now another group has looked into a different part at the heart of the Milky Way. Now, let's take a look at a sort of wide angle view of the heart of the Milky Way. You can see that bright region where Sag A star, where the supermassive black hole is at the heart of the Milky Way. But then there are these other regions around Sag B, Sag C, and other interesting, the snake. There's these different features around there. and. Sagittarius C is one of these really interesting targets. It is a place where new stars are being formed. And this is something that astronomers long thought shouldn't be that possible. Like you've got this region that is thousands of times more densely packed with stars than our part of the Milky Way. And all of these stars are producing radiation. They should be blasting away any new star forming material so that nothing should form. And yet, here is a star forming region. So, this incredible picture of Sagittarius C contains about 500,000 stars. And you can see, sort of at the top of this image, there's this darker region. It's kind of like, um, like a dark nebula. Now, Webb is designed with its infrared view to look through the gas and the dust. And so this region at the top is called an infrared dark region. In other words, it is still so tightly packed with gas and dust that even an infrared view can't look through it. This is the kind of task that Webb is perfectly designed for. It is going to give us so much additional information about the heart of the Milky Way and other really kind of dense star forming regions like this. A secret Chinese payload crashed onto the moon. Last year, astronomers noticed that an asteroid was on a collision course with the moon. And then with follow on observations, they realized this isn't an asteroid, this is a piece of space debris. And they originally thought that it was the upper stage of a SpaceX, like a Falcon booster that had sent a mission to the moon. But with more calculations, they realized that this is the upper stage booster for the Chinese Chang'e 5 mission. And Chang'e 5, this is the one that retrieved the sample from the surface of the moon and brought it back to Earth. So then the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter did high resolution images of the area where this object smashed into the moon. And they saw something really surprising. There was two craters side by side, it was a double crater. Now if a booster was going to be returning back to Earth, this makes sense. Um, you know, the booster would break up in the Earth's atmosphere, and you could have multiple pieces hitting the Earth, and you would get multiple craters, but there's no atmosphere on the moon. And so this thing would hold together as one single piece, all the way down to the impact site, like maybe it was spinning too fast, it could tear itself apart, but it would have done that earlier. So it's really surprising that you got this. And so one theory is that in fact, this was intentional, that there was an additional secret payload that was smashed into the surface of the moon. So this is similar to like when NASA purposefully smashed something into the moon with their LCROSS mission to get a look at under the surface of the moon. 
maybe that's what they were planning. Now, the Chinese have not officially admitted that this was their booster, that in fact, they say that it re-entered the Earth's atmosphere a long time ago. But the US military says no, the Chinese booster never re-entered the Earth's atmosphere. So <laughs> moving on. Every week, we give you a chance to vote and tell us what you think is the most exciting story of the week. And this week's vote was a hack. We told you that the Starship launch was about to happen, and that was the winner. We got 41% of people voted for that as their favorite story. Well, I wonder what's going to happen this week after we actually report on the actual story that actually happened. Thanks to everybody who voted. This is becoming one of my favorite parts to interact with the channel. It's super fun to sort of see what you think is really important. It's always funny to find the people who are voting and they find week after week they're doing not the one that is most popular. But I, you know, I think you just have very good taste. Now, you can see the vote if you're just scrolling on your phone. It'll show up in your YouTube feed. You can also go to the community tab and you can vote there. But the best way to see it is if make sure you're subscribed to our channel and then click on the notifications bell. And then that gives you like just the most chance that YouTube is going to try to show you this vote so you can participate in it. More plutonium for NASA missions. In the inner solar system, you can use solar panels to power your spacecraft. But once you're far away from the sun, then the amount of electricity that you can generate from solar power goes way down and you need to switch to some other method. And the one that NASA has traditionally used is a radioisotope thermoelectric generator. So you saw one of these in The Martian, if you remember the scene where he's kind of cold in his rover, he needs a way to warm up his rover. And so he goes and finds the this sort of nuclear power plant that was being used by their spacecraft. He brings it back, brings it into the rover, and that keeps him toasty warm. And that's because it is a chunk of decaying plutonium that is giving off heat as it decays. And then it uses a thermocouple to turn that heat into electricity for the spacecraft. And so it's like, you know, much less energy than, say, a nuclear reactor, but it's very dependable. It lasts for decades. Think about what happened with the Voyager spacecraft. They've got chunks that are about four kilograms, and they've been lasting since 1977, and they're still going. So there are RTGs and New Horizons in Perseverance and Curiosity in the Voyagers and Cassini. So all these flagship missions in the outer solar system. But back in the early 2000s, NASA was running out of plutonium. They weren't getting any more supplied to them by the Department of Energy, and they were starting to have to ration. I think New Horizons was one of the last spacecraft that were able to cobble together plutonium to be able to do this. When Perseverance was built, they were able to get new plutonium from the Department of Energy and be able to build the rover with that. And now NASA is getting regular shipments of this for future spacecraft, so they don't have to sort of scrounge around for it and wait to the last minute. And so they, they just got a delivery of 500 grams, which is like about an eighth of what you had in one of the Voyager spacecraft. So they're going to need more, but it's, it gives them a chance to do testing, gives them a chance for smaller uses for this plutonium for other spacecraft. One really kind of cool thing about this plutonium, for example, is on the Spirit and Opportunity rovers, they use solar panels, but as an additional way to keep their batteries warm through the long Martian nights, they had these little pellets of this plutonium that would just give off just enough heat to keep their batteries warm and to stop them from shutting down. So now they've got more to work with, and hopefully there's just going to be a steady supply coming from this point on. So more emissions to the outer solar system, please. Like that sounds like what you would need if you wanted to go to, I don't know, Neptune and Triton. There aren't many galaxies like the Milky Way nearby. Now we know why. The Milky Way is a barred spiral galaxy. It has this bright central bar, and then it has these spiral arms, very distinctive spiral arms. And astronomers have seen many examples of this out across the universe. It's always tricky to know exactly what the Milky Way looks like because we are embedded inside of it. I mean, astronomers are fairly certain that it has a bar, that it has two spiral arms, that it probably has a slight warp to it. But when we look at the larger structure that the Milky Way is embedded within, it's called the supergalactic plane. And it is a kind of flattened region that is about a billion light years long and contains just countless galaxies in it. But when astronomers have done a survey of the galaxies in the supergalactic plane, they don't see the majority of these spiral galaxies they see mostly elliptical galaxies. Now, elliptical galaxies are the result of a merger. So think about what's going to happen when the Milky Way and the Andromeda crash into each other in a few billion years from now, they're going to merge and they will lose their spiral arms. They will become this giant 
amorphous blob of stars. M87 is a good example of this. And astronomers were surprised to see so many of them. They did computer simulations of the history of the supergalactic plane. And what they found was that there have been a lot of mergers and interactions in our area of the universe. And this has led to many more elliptical galaxies and sort of wiping out the spiral galaxies. And that's why we have more ellipticals than spirals. You're watching Space Bites, but every week we do another show that we call the Q&A, the questions and answers. And this is a chance for you to ask me questions. And we do this every Monday at 5 p.m. Pacific time on the channel as a live stream. Uh, I take some questions that have been prepared by people putting questions into the comments, and then I do the rest of the show completely live. I have no idea what your questions are gonna be. And when you watch the edited version, we have both of that in the show. But in fact, the whole question show is much longer. They now go for about two hours. So we record about the first hour of it and then the second hour of it we call overtime. And that's often like more casual or um, more rapid fire answers to questions. Or sometimes I'll just chew on like one big question for 20 minutes or half an hour or rant. So it's sort of like a different tone for the rest of the episode. We make the show unlisted. So if you want to make sure that you see the full question show sort of in its raw, unedited form, just make sure you subscribe to the channel. And if you click the notifications bell, then you will get an email from YouTube with a link, a permanent link to where that show is. And then you can watch that after the fact if you can't be there live. But it's most fun live. Come, hang out, ask your questions, I'll answer them. Jump in with follow-ons from other people in the chat. And sometimes we'll do follow-on questions. It's a lot of fun. Now, if you want it just to show up automatically as a podcast, then if you're a patron, then you get access to the patron-only podcast feed that contains all of the overtime segments sort of nicely edited down and they just automatically show up. We also release our monthly patron-only question show, which is like now almost three hours long. So, uh, so if you want more content, definitely subscribe to our Patreon. Go to patreon.com slash universe today. The universe can't hide behind the zone of avoidance anymore. There's a bit of a meme on this channel where people ask me about the zone of avoidance or the great attractor. And you know, the zone of avoidance is just the reality that at the center of the Milky Way, there's a lot of gas and dust that is completely opaque to visible light telescopes. In other words, if you're going to point your telescope at the center of the Milky Way, you're not going to see anything. And so, you know, the term that I like better than the zone of avoidance, because it's not like it's like some kind of cosmic law. It is like the zone of don't bother. So if you're gonna point your telescope there, there's not really anything great that you can see. But those days are over thanks to infrared telescopes like James Webb. It can see through the gas and dust in infrared light. And in fact, it can see right through the zone of avoidance out the other side and start to map the galaxies that are on the other side of the Milky Way. And over time, as infrared telescopes have been improving, astronomers have been chipping away at the regions behind. And now a new survey called the Vista Variables in Via Lactea, VVV, they're actually looking specifically at this area. They were able to turn up hundreds of galaxies that had not been seen before in any other infrared survey of the center of the Milky Way. And they figured when their work is done, they will find thousands more of these galaxies. And so now, like what is the great attractor? Just count up all the galaxies on the other side of the Milky Way. That is your great attractor. How to save Earth from an asteroid. It's not a question of if an asteroid is gonna hit the Earth, it's a matter of when. And you know, most likely it won't be for the next few thousand years, something bad will happen. But still, now that we are aware that the problem is there, we should get to work on it. There's the technical challenges of actually stopping an asteroid, but there are probably a lot of kind of political and economic issues that you probably even thought about. So in 2023, a group came together called the Planetary Defense Conference, and they ran a simulation of what would happen if a 500 meter asteroid was discovered and we had 12.5 years of warning. And 500 meter asteroid is a very bad day for a large chunk of the planet. It's not a continent killer, but it is something that would take out a very large area. You know, people across thousands of kilometers would be affected. And so they thought about like, what are the technical challenges? And you know, we saw with DART that theoretically we have the technology to try and stop an asteroid. The more preparation we do, the more we'll be able to stop it. But what they also found was that the political and economic issues are overwhelming. 
like think about this, right? Like if we know that an asteroid is going to strike some certain country on Earth, then the right move is to get away from that region and go somewhere else. Well, these are refugees who are going to be fleeing their homes before their homes are destroyed. Where are they going to go? Who's going to take them? Who's going to pay for it? What's going to happen to the economy? What's going to happen to the economy in those countries leading up to the asteroid strike? It's sort of mind boggling. And, and in this paper, they just realize just how much of a can of worms this is and how we really haven't even begun to consider the implications of an asteroid strike. I'm going to talk about this sort of general idea some more. But first, I'd like to thank our patrons. A special thanks to Stephen Krasaki, David Richards, Mark Ansis, Joel Yancey, Antonio Lofilara, Dustin Cable, Vlad Shipland, Modso, George, David Giltonan, Andrew Gross, Jeremy Mattern, Josh Schultz, and Jordan Young, who support us at the Master of the Universe level, and all of our other supporters on Patreon. We've been through a couple of events recently that have given us like a little bit of a hint of how planet Earth would respond to some kind of extreme event. There was, of course, the COVID pandemic, and we saw Although some people took it very seriously, other people didn't. Things were inconsistent. A lot of people died. There was an enormous economic cost, both in what the disease did, but in also our response to it. And people still argue, like I'm sure people watching this right now, they agree that the impact was extreme and they don't agree sort of on which way it went down. And, and you know, I'm not here to argue about that. But then we are dealing with another unfolding crisis, which is global warming. And again, it's long and it's slow and it's inexorable and it's affecting different people around the world differently. Um, and it requires a planetary response to this situation. Um, an asteroid trying to defend the Earth from an asteroid, especially one that's going to hit a regional area, it's going to affect a very specific group of people, and not so much other people, is the kind of tricky thorny problem that we've demonstrated we're just not great at. And when you think about this and like solar storms that could wipe out, say, the grid on a certain part of the Earth, there is a class of sort of existential threats or, or I don't know, mega disasters that that we need to start thinking about and come up with a better model. They share a lot in common. They require a group response from the entire planet. We need to think about the, the sooner we take action, the less the impact of the disaster will be. And I really hope that we've now been through a couple of these or we're in the process of a couple of these that will really help us better able to deal with a potential asteroid impact. And on that bright note, we'll see you next week.